What's happening, y'all? Welcome inside the Fantasy Stock Exchange. Danny and Bush coming at you with a 2022 and 2023 combined rookie mock draft. It, this is going to be a fun exercise. Basically, what we're going to be doing is taking a way too early preview of the 2023 rookie class and basically deciphering what are the value of these players relative to the value of the current rookies that we have. And obviously, the takeaway from this is determining, you know, what a 2023 first is worth relative to a 2022 first. So for those of you guys that enjoy content like this, again, leave a like down below, comment any of your thoughts down below, subscribe to the channel if you are new. For those of you guys that are patrons, uh, we will be uploading some kind of like database for the 2023 class in the coming weeks and months. So um, stay tuned for that. And if you're not a member of the Patreon, the, the link is down below for that. You can get all access to all of our Dynasty rankings, um, you know, quarterback, running back, wide receiver, tight end, rookie rankings. Uh, bucketed rankings by age, all that kind of stuff is available over at uh, patreon.com forward slash fantasy stock exchange. But before we get into this, Danny, how are you doing? I'm doing well, doing well. And yeah, a lot of questions we see on, you know, past videos that we've had in the discord on Twitter, you guys are basically asking us, I have the 105 or 106 this year. Should I trade this for an early to mid projected 2023 first? And for a lot of people that might just seem foreign. Okay, well, what do I expect from this 2023 class? Basically, use this video as your guide to understanding the relative value. So you guys will see we have, again, guys listed next year that are going to go ahead of potential mid to late round rookie or first round rookie picks this year. So you guys can kind of get that sense that, oh, if I have the 106, like, yeah, if somebody's offering me a random 2023 first, I can take it because as you guys will see, these this upcoming class is going to be a treat for fantasy football for dynasty managers. For sure. But before we get into it, got to hit the intro first. So like I said, if you guys skip the intro, what we're doing here today is a 2022 prospects combined with the 2023 prospects rookie mock draft. So we're going to go two rounds here. It will be a super flex mock draft. And we're just going to go, you know, position by position, player by player, kind of talk about and preview the class. So the first guy that we're going to talk about, the consensus 101, hook him fucking horns, B. John Robinson running back from the Texas Longhorns. This is the 101 in this class. Unless a absolutely catastrophic injury happens to B. John Robinson, I don't anticipate this changing from now until the start of the college football season. We have way too much information about this guy at this point in time. He's a five-star recruit in 2020, number one recruit at the running back position in that class, 8.2 yards per carry as a freshman, 142.2 yards per game in his sophomore season, 15 touchdowns, only played in nine games and a half. He left the Kansas game early. Projected first round draft capital in the NFL. I've seen way too early 2023 mock drafts have him as a top 15 pick, top 20 pick. 35% dominator rating this year as a true sophomore would have ranked in the 83rd percentile if he were draft eligible. 12.1% target share in the 87th percentile. So you're getting, not only is this guy, you know, a freak of nature, six foot, 215 pound workhorse type back. He also has receiving chops and not just like catching checkdowns. Like he split out wide. He can run routes. He kind of reminds me of like Dalvin Cook if he was a better receiver. Yeah. And uh, the, the comp I basically had to like when I first started watching him was similar to Zeke. Again, if, if he gets fourth overall draft capital, I mean, slam it in. This guy's going to be a top half of the first round startup pick next year, which we'll get into where his rank amongst dynasty running backs will be going to next year. But if you're talking about a prospect, I mean. He is the definition of a bulletproof running back prospect. Production, efficiency, receiving volume, height, weight, size profile, and projected draft capital next year, as you mentioned, in that top 15 to top 20. There is as pristine a look as to what's going to end up being, as I'll say right now, the dynasty running back one as soon as he steps foot on an NFL field. As soon as he gets drafted in April next year, I'm telling you guys this right now, he is going to be my dynasty running back one. So as a result, this guy's going to be a top seven or eight, most likely startup pick going into next year. Yeah, this is guaranteed locked and loaded first round guy. Like you have everything, like you said, everything that he has for his profile, not to mention the fact that he was a highly decorated high school recruit to boot as well. So yeah, B. John Robinson running back from the Texas Longhorns. I'm going to have a lot of fun watching him this year. Hopefully oh, yeah. he stays healthy. Hopefully he's able to, you know, build upon what he showed as a sophomore because he was en route. You know, there's there's clips of him, Gus Johnson yelling, give him the call like to New York for a Heisman Trophy candidate. I actually have a personal bet 
on him winning the Heisman Trophy this year, I think that it is definitely possible. So Bijan Robinson, the 101 in the 2023 class and 2022 combined mock draft. I'll let you go with the 102. And this, again, remember, is a super flex mock draft. For sure. And as you mentioned, because it is a super flex, I'm going to go with the consensus quarterback one going into the next year. And that's going to be CJ Stroud quarterback from the Ohio State Buckeyes. Hurts me to say this as a Michigan Wolverine fan, but this guy is going to light up college football next year. I mean, we're talking about a guy that is, again, as I mentioned, the projected first quarterback off the board, never leaving the top five of any way too early 2023 mocks at this current point. And if you're getting a quarterback with this size profile, with this accuracy profile, with this production profile, mixing that in with top five draft capital, this guy, this is a guy who's going to be a top 12 dynasty quarterback as soon as he commits to that NFL draft. And as I mentioned, I mean, he is significantly better than any single quarterback in the 2022 class. Heck, if he was a draft eligible player this year, if he committed to the NFL draft this year, if he was eligible, this is a guy that wouldn't have made it past the Detroit Lions at number two overall. That's how good he is. I mean, you're talking about a guy that put up this year in his sophomore campaign, a 72% completion percentage, 10.1 yards per attempt, along with a 44 to six touchdown interception ratio with the Ohio state Buckeyes. We're going to talk about his uh, number one target a little bit later, but CJ Stroud bulletproof quarterback prospect. And as I kind of mentioned, I expect this guy to be a top 12 quarterback as soon as he commits to the draft. Yeah. He, he's got a lot of buzz surrounding him already um, for, you know, potential Heisman. I think he's the Heisman favorite right now, if not yep. uh, outside of, you know, the next guy that we're going to talk about. I think it's those two guys at the top. So yeah, CJ Stroud, uh, hopefully he doesn't, you know, lose a step this year without Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave. He still has a guy that we're going to talk about in a few picks yep. um, as a, a stud wide receiver to throw to. And it's Ohio state. I mean, I'm sure they got plenty of other talented uh, pass catchers on the, uh, on the roster and they still have Travion Henderson running the ball. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I mean, talk about Stroud. He's going to be the 102 here. He's going to be a top two round startup pick next year. The guy that people may argue over CJ Stroud is going to be the reigning Heisman Trophy uh, winner. And that's going to be Bryce Young from Alabama. Again, as I kind of mentioned, Stroud is the number one consensus amongst NFL circles right now. Bryce Young's not too far behind him. The projected number two quarterback off the board in 2023. And as I kind of mentioned, Stroud would have been top two in this draft. So would have Bryce Young. If Bryce Young was eligible this year, he is not making it past the Detroit Lions at number two. And as I mentioned, reigning Heisman winner, he can create a structure. He is able to put up uh, put up elite production as we saw this past year. Now you add Jermaine uh, Jermaine Burton to that offense as well as we're going to kind of get into Jameer Gibbs as we're going to get kind of get into. Uh, I expect Ohio State and Alabama to be two of the top four teams in the nation. So as a result, as long as Bryce Young gets that adequate draft capital, he has the production profile from a quarterback to be quite literally the 101 this year if he was in our rookie drafts. Right. And I think with both of these guys, you're talking about, you know, high level production and against very good competition, high level, you know, pressure packed games in the college football playoffs coming up this year. Both of them are going to get nitpicked, right? Bryce Young's a little smaller. He's definitely going to get nitpicked from a size perspective. But uh, I think when it comes down to it, the NFL is going to value these guys highly. They're going to get drafted in the top three, top five picks next year. And we're going to, as a result, have them as a top two round startup pick when we are doing dynasty startups in January, February, March, April, and May of next season. So uh, those two guys, yeah, again, any one of those three players would be the consensus 101 this year. And uh, the guy that we have next is actually the consensus 101 yeah. this year in, in Brees Hall, running back for the New York Jets. Again, he's the 101 this year, but he would be the 104 next year for us as, as it currently stands. And I think we're, we might even be being generous with that uh, 104 because these next two receivers that we're going to talk about would definitely have a case to be the 101 in this year's class if they were eligible. And we didn't have an elite quarterback this year, which is why Brees Hall was able to you know catapult himself to the 101. And if you guys want more info on any of the current, you know, 2022 players, we did our positional rankings the last couple of days. So if you want to check out, you don't know who Brees Hall is or whatever, and you want to go check out some more information about him, just go check out the running back rankings and vice versa for all the other positions. So Brees Hall would be the 104 in this mock draft. Let's get on to the number five overall player. Who, yep. Again, I think you could make the argument that if he was in this class, he would be the 101. And I think some people will comment down below, how the hell is he not, you know, ahead of Brees yep. Hall? Jackson Smith and Jigba, number uh, number one wide receiver for the Ohio State yep. Buckeyes this year. He led Ohio State in receiving, which Chris, Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave were both top 11 NFL draft picks, and he outproduced both of them this year as a sophomore when those guys were a junior and a senior, respectively. So even if we exclude the 347 three-touchdown bowl game that he had against Utah where Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave did not play because they were preparing for the NFL draft, he still outproduced both of those guys by about 300 receiving yards each. 
projected top 10 draft capital next year. I'm seeing way too early mock drafts of him yeah. going number three overall, number four overall. This guy is elite alpha wide receiver one potential in the NFL. He's not the yeah. biggest guy in the world. He's like six foot, 195 pounds, pretty similar you know, stature to the other two Ohio State wide receivers. But um, this is a dude that the production speaks for itself. High level production against high level competition. And we kind of cite in Dynasty like, oh, well, who's going to be the next Jamar Chase? Who's going to be the next Justin Jefferson? And from a prospect profile standpoint, Jackson Smith and Jigba can be that guy. I mean, you kind of outlined it. He outproduced two top 11 picks despite being two years younger than both of them. Let's take that into context for a second. Jackson Smith and Jigba, a 2002, outproduced two top 11 picks who were both 2000 born players. Absolutely ridiculous. And I kind of outlined it here, but if he, I mean, going into a 2023 startup, uh, if he's going anywhere outside of those top 10 wide receivers, and I think that's even a, a, a floor type of projection for him, he could be a top five type of wide receiver in dynasty as soon as he gets dropped in the top 10, as soon as he enters the NFL. Yeah, you mentioned it. Maybe we're even being generous to Brees Hall, putting him over JSN, but man, like, JSN is going to be a locked and loaded fantasy superstar for the next 15 years as soon as he gets drafted. Yeah, he's he's a stud, man. Um, the next guy that we're going to talk about is also a stud wide receiver. And this guy is definitely going to get nitpicked more than JSN because of one crucial factor. He's six foot, 170 pounds as it current, is currently listed right now. And that's Jordan Addison, wide receiver from, I mean, he's currently you know, a Pittsburgh Panther, but he has entered the transfer portal. There's rumors that he might go to USC. I know Texas has been involved. I would literally fucking cream my pants. If we have Jordan Addison, B. John Robinson, Xavier, Xavier Worthy. Worthy all on one team, 96th percentile breakout age for Jordan Addison commanded a 21% target share as a true freshman blew the fuck up this year, 1600 yards, 17 touchdowns on route to the Blitnikoff award. Again, I said it with Kenny Pickett, Jordan Addison made Kenny Pickett. And Kenny Pickett owes a good portion of his first round, you know, draft capital uh, paycheck to Jordan Addison because he got him drafted in the first round. We don't know for certain. Like I said, if he'll be back at Pittsburgh, I think it's very unlikely that he is. He did enter the transfer portal. It's probably likely that he goes to USC with Caleb Williams, which will just be a ton of fun. <laughs> the only con that I saw in Jordan Addison's game, and I got a, a good look at him because I watched five full games of Kenny Pickett play, is that he's undersized, right? He's six foot, 170 pounds. Sound familiar? Sounds like Devontae Smith, right? It yeah. sounds a lot like Devontae Smith all over again. Bolitnikov winner, six foot, 170 pounds, except Jordan Addison has a much better analytics profile than Devontae Smith ever had. Yep, I was just about to say that. I mean, you kind of mentioned that um, that Devontae Smith comparison. Obviously, in Devontae Smith's final year, he ended up winning the Heisman. I wouldn't be at all shocked if Jordan Addison won the Heisman last or next year as well. I mean, this is a phenomenal target hog type of wide receiver that should be locked and loaded at minimum with top 15 draft capital next year. Yeah, I mean, he lands in a spot. I mean, he could be Trevor Lawrence's wide receiver one next year. He could be, you know, Justin Fields' wide receiver one next year. A lot of wide receiver needy teams should be occupying that top of the draft. And as we saw this past year, if this if teams view you as a wide receiver one, even a wide receiver two in the NFL, you are going to fly off the board in the NFL draft, given the current market for wide receivers in terms of pay scale. Shout out to Christian Kirk for absolutely ruining that. I would be shocked if this guy wasn't at minimum a top 20 pick, given his production profile, given the fact that he broke out early, as you said. He shouldn't be leaving the top 15 to 20 at minimum wide receivers off the board in your dynasty drafts going into next year. And uh, that's a similar case I have for the next guy off the list. And a guy that people might be watching right now and thinking, how the heck has Kayshawn Boutte not heard his name called the wide receiver from LSU? And this is the Debbie darling. This is a guy that Debbie Twitter has had a hard on for ever since he stepped field for LSU. I mean, we're talking about a guy that has a 98th percentile breakout age and he tore it up down the stretch in 2020's final three games after Terrace Marshall declared for the draft we're talking about a guy that was putting up 111 yards against Alabama 100 plus yards in his next game and topped it off with a 14 for 308 and three touchdown performance against Ole Miss in his final game as an 18 year old freshman we saw this year or again sorry in that year as well he commanded an 18.5% target share in the 10 games he played as an 18-year-old true freshman at fucking LSU. 
Let's just contextualize for a sec. 18.5% target share at LSU as an 18-year-old true freshman. And we saw this past year prior to the foot injury that held him out. He was commanding targets, and he was hella efficient. 6.3 receptions, 84.8 receiving yards, and 1.5 receiving touchdowns per game prior to that injury. This is a guy that has a legitimate case for the wide receiver one in the class if he can hold a full healthy campaign going into 2022. And as we kind of mentioned with Addison, top 15 to 20 wide receiver at worst when it comes to dynasty circles. And I wouldn't at all be shocked if this was a guy threatening JSN for that top crown, if he can hold, as I mentioned, a healthy campaign in 2022. Yeah, the, the, these wide receivers next year at the Phenomenal. top are stronger than this year. Uh, depth wise, maybe you want to argue this year's class over next year's because we don't know exactly what we're getting out of some of the other deeper names that we're going to talk about. But um, at the top, I, the, these top three names are, are as ironclad as you can get as prospects. They're not the biggest guys in the world outside of Boutte, but um, they are very, very, very productive um, in their uh, college offenses and, you know, target shares galore type of thing. So uh, let's get into the next guy that we're talking about. So, so far, this should answer the question. You know, if I have the 102 this year and somebody offers me an early 2023 first, should I take it? If you're a rebuilding team, absolutely. Right. Like you, you want one of these guys, whether it's Bijan, whether it's these quarterbacks, whether it's one of these wide receivers, you want these dudes. And we still got plenty of names to talk about. Oh yeah. Sneak up into that area. So the next guy that comes from the 2022 class is our 108 in this draft, uh, Drake London. I love Drake London, but again, this is what we're dealing with. Drake London. We got some ironclad prospects next year and Drake London was as close to ironclad as you can get. He definitely has the size over some of those other guys, but we did have some concerns with like separation and stuff like that. Um, but I do think, you know, gun to my head right now, would I take Kayshawn Boutte or Drake London? Given the injury concern with Kayshawn Boutte, I might take Drake More London, but I would still take Jordan Addison and, and uh, Jackson Smith and Jigba over Drake London. Those guys are all going to be, you know, probably first round graded wide receivers for me. Drake London, my wide receiver won this year, 102 overall in 2022 drafts, falls at 108 here. Um, and let's get to the 109, who was your wide yeah. receiver one pre-draft. Yeah, and I mean, it's Traylon Burks and... It's funny because we're talking about from a pure analytical, from a pure domination standpoint from a collegiate level. I mean, these guys are on par with the wide receivers this year, except again, we know draft cycle, more question marks are going to raise about, you know, Boutte's game, Addison's game and uh, Jackson Smith and Jigwa's game. But at this point, they're more polished and ready, if you will, pro ready than even a Traylon Burks is. And I love Traylon Burks. I think his ceiling is top five, but Putting him ahead of some of those, as you mentioned, ironclad type of prospects, both from an NFL projection standpoint and from an analytical standpoint, it's tough. Again, Traylon Brooks at nine, I did not think he would be this low going into the exercise, but man, the draft class next year is so, so good that some talented names are going to fall here, man. Yeah, uh, a guy that could have an absolutely meteoric rise this year, given the school that he just transferred to. Number 10, 110 on this list would be Jameer Gibbs, running back from the Alabama Crimson Tide. Previously played for Georgia Tech for two seasons. Very, very fun film. I watch this, watch this guy's highlight tape, literally. Just go watch him. Tell me who you think he reminds you of because he looks exactly like Alvin Kamara to me. Five foot 11, 200 pounds is the concern with him right now. How big is this dude? Is he going to be small? Is he going to be, you know, pass catching back only in the NFL? But 43 targets in 12 games, 13% target share in the 90th percentile. If he were draft eligible this year, again, he transfers to Alabama for his final season should be a legit Heisman contender. In my opinion, if he's able to be productive, get a big workload at Alabama. The only question mark I have about Jameer Gibbs is how big is he? Cause if he comes in five eleven, two Oh nine, I have no question marks about this dude because he is a phenomenal receiver. And he's also very, very explosive. Great athlete reminds me a ton of Alvin Kamara. And I know he's going to remind NFL scouts of Alvin Kamara too. Yeah. Very, you know, Alvin Kamara, Aaron Jones ask, you know, a very, um, explosive runner that can, as you mentioned, contribute phenomenally in the receiving game. I mean, we already mentioned Bryce Young. We're going to mention another Alabama name. Alabama is the national title favorite this year. And Jameer Gibbs, as you mentioned, can go absolutely nuclear. I wouldn't be shocked. Again, we have him at 10 right now. I wouldn't be shocked if by year's end, he's top five. Yeah, exactly. So a guy that, again, you could make the argument should be ahead of from this draft class. Garrett Wilson, wide receiver from the New York Jets. I think, again, with, with London, with Burks, with Wilson, they were the top three, you know, cream of the crop receivers in this year's class. You could make the argument that, you know, because we know where they went, we know how high they went in the draft. They've already been through the draft cycle that if we were actually doing this exercise for a real team, 
then maybe you want to take them a little bit higher yeah. just because of that unknown factor is not there with them. But uh, yeah, Garrett Wilson, crazy, crazy that he's going 111 as good of a prospect as he was. For sure. And uh, outlining Garrett Wilson, as uh, we kind of mentioned, I mean, the fact that the 10th, 2022 10th overall pick is our 11th rated rookie is just ridiculous. But I mean, talking about this class, it's easy to see why. You can't rank him over his former teammate in JSN when JSN literally outproduced Garrett Wilson despite being two years younger. I love Garrett Wilson, but if anybody comments on this video that he should be above JSN from a pure prospect standpoint, you're wrong. And then finally, closing out the first round would be another guy from this draft class, the guy who closes out our top five, uh, that top five tier for us is Kenneth Walker. Uh, running back from the Seattle Seahawks. Walker could end up sliding down further down this board, to be honest, especially with some of the other running backs that we have next year. Could have, you know, better production profiles and better years than them. Uh, but with Kenneth Walker, again, at least we know he was a high draft pick, went to a situation that uh, should have a lot of volume going forward in the future. So if we were drafting this team as of today, Kenneth Walker would still be a first round pick for us. But as you guys can see, the first round is over with. We have uh, five guys from the 2022 class and seven guys from the 2023 class. So if you guys are at 106, 107 in your rookie draft and somebody offers you an early to mid 2023 first, jump on it. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, wow. I mean, the fact that we're talking about Kenneth Walker, the consensus 105 this year as the 12th ranked player combined with these next two classes is ridiculous. And we kind of outlined it here, but... I wouldn't be shocked if a couple of the names that we have listed behind him may actually usurp him going into next year. Ton of quality running back prospect it is going to be a treat going into that 2020 class. The first one of that list behind Kenneth Walker is going to be Sean Tucker running back from the Syracuse Orange. And he kind of just checks all the boxes that you would want for from a prototypical NFL running back prospect. His size. 5'11", 209 listed on the Syracuse website. I expect him by the time he's ready to go into the NFL to be weighing around that 215 to 220 range. We typically see these running back prospects bulk by a few pounds as they're going into the NFL. But even if he goes in 5'11", 209, more than enough to suffice from a pure workhorse type of standpoint. Production, about 1,700 yards from scrimmage and 14 touchdowns in the 12 games he played this past year. NFL draft pedigree. He's a projected day two draft capital type of back top 40 to top 50 type of draft capital. So when you're talking about all of those boxes, Sean Tucker meets them and Sean Tucker meets them well. He doesn't really have much of a negative to his profile other than the fact that maybe he's not, you know, the dynamic player a Gibbs is, a dynamic player that obviously a Bijan is. But I mean, from a pure, you know, RB1 projectable standpoint, workhorse projectable standpoint, Tucker meets all those uh, boxes as long as he doesn't bust in 2022. Yeah, and a guy as a, you know, what looks like a bigger back than 5, you know, 11, 210. Definitely looks looks like, you know, he's more like Nick Chubb size, like 5'11", yeah. 220. And he did, you know, produce relatively as a receiver, 20 receptions this year, over 12.5 yards per catch as well. So hopefully he can build upon that receiving role. He is, you know, the offense there. He's Syracuse's offense. So um, he should be a, you know, locked and loaded workhorse. His his profile kind of reminds me a little bit like Brees's, to be honest. He's just, just college workhorse, very productive. Probably not going to end up being the RB1 or two in this class, most likely, but um, could be a very good, you know, back of the first round pick come 2023 draft. Yep. So uh, the next guy that we have here, I think is probably the, has the highest ceiling of some of the other guys that we're going to talk about in the second round, which is Zach Evans running back now for the Ole Miss Rebels. He transferred away from TCU this past year, right behind Bijan Robinson coming in as a high school recruit, five-star running back prospect, second running back class or second running back in that class, average 7.7 .7 and 7.0 yards per carry as a freshman and a sophomore at TCU averaged over 130 rushing and receiving yards combined this past year dealt with some injuries some poor scheme wasn't necessarily the workhorse in that offense so he transferred away to the SEC uh for Ole Miss and I think heading to the SEC and Ole Miss this has the potential to be this year's Kenneth Walker right this has the potential to be the guy that has the meteoric rise potential Heisman cont uh, like contender um guy that goes you know way way over some of the guys like Sean Tucker and Jameer Gibbs. I think Zach Evans has a huge, huge ceiling if he, you know, breaks out this year with Ole Miss because he was productive at TCU, but he didn't necessarily reach his full potential yet. Yeah, for sure. I mean, this is, uh, as you kind of mentioned, 7.77 7 yards per carry in the last two years as a freshman and a sophomore. I mean, he is very, very efficient on a touch per or a touch basis period. Um, I'm very interested to see how he does at Ole Miss, how he does in the SEC, because if he has a very productive 
consistent year this year. I mean, you kind of outlined it. He could sneak into the back end of the first in the NFL draft. He could be a top 40 type of pick. And at that point, again, you mentioned his ceiling is to get above a Tucker, to get above a um, Kenneth Walker. But given, you know, the kind of question marks we have, we're going to slate him in that 202. But I wouldn't be shocked if this was a guy that ended up being a top six pick in the 2023 rookie draft. Yeah, exactly. I think the the sketchy thing for him, though, is that, you know, Matt Corral's gone. No more, you know, quarterback at Ole Miss. Hopefully the team is a little bit better than maybe I anticipate it being because uh, that'll obviously help out Zach Evans a lot. But if he's the workhorse there, like if they feed him 280 carries or something like that and he's efficient on his touches and, you know, looks really great, then he still has a chance to be a very, you know, big Kenneth Walker candidate like uh, type of breakout for this year. So the next two guys that we have on the list here, yeah. both from this year's class, I'll let you take it away with those two guys. Yeah, I'll just kind of group them together because there's not much differentiation, you know, pick and choose whatever, which one you want to go above the other. But Chris Olave, Jameson, Williams, former OSU teammates uh, from a couple years ago. But I mean, with Olave, it's pretty simple. 11th overall pick. You can't rank him above Garrett Wilson because Garrett Wilson was a better prospect coming in. And then you can't rank him above JSN because JSN outproduced him despite being, again, as I mentioned, two years his junior. So Olave is just going to be a really good, you know, wide receiver two, wide receiver one B type for his career. And I can see him, you know, putting together multiple top 24 seasons, multiple top 30 seasons. Just from a ceiling standpoint, I can't, again, as I mentioned, put him above some of those 2022 and 2023 guys, as we said. Same thing with Jameson Williams, only he's kind of the inverse of Olave, where his ceiling is sky high, but his floor may be lower given the fact that he's coming back from an injury, given the fact that he still has to improve from a nuanced standpoint to be a pro-ready NFL type of player. But again, we know the ceiling on Jameson Williams. I mean, nobody on the earth pretty much I mean, amongst the wide receiver position moves the way he does from uh, a sheer size speed type of standpoint. Uh, the only real comparable in that regard would be what Tyree kill. Like, can you, can you think of anybody else that moves the way Jameson Williams does on a football field? No, it's, it, he's, he's pretty crazy. He's a pretty special uh, athlete for sure. So those, those two guys, again, if you want to take any of those, uh, if you're actually doing this exercise with a real dynasty team, if you wanted to take either of those guys over some of the questionable, you know, question marks that we have with Zach Evans and stuff like that. No, no complaints there. Another guy at 205 here from the 2023 class that is definitely at risk of falling a lot if he has a bad season this year, but he had us real excited about him as after his freshman year, which was tanks, uh, tank Bigsby running back from Auburn. Bit of a down year for him this year. He only averaged like 4.9 yards per carry. Uh, could end up being a day two pick at running back, just like Sean Tucker, like we said, if he has another good season this year, listed at six foot 208, and he's got a solid three down skill set, was able to produce as a receiver as well. Hopefully he can bounce back because he, you know, definitely disappointed as a sophomore this year. Hopefully it's more like uh, the J.K. Dobbins timeline because when J.K. Dobbins came into Ohio State, great freshman year, down sophomore year, great junior year. Hopefully that's what Tank Bigsby does. Yep. No, I, I fully agree with you. Tank Bigsby is a, a very volatile player because I can see his name working completely up on this list, but I can also see him falling off this list completely. Uh, if he has, again, as you mentioned, another inefficient season in 2022, uh, moving off of tanks, Bigsby, we're going to get to our next receiver. And this guy is just a freak six foot four, 205 pounds plays fast. I mean, this is just your specimen of the 2023 class. Talking about Quentin Johnson, wide receiver from TCU. And again, the main question mark here is that he's not as productive as some of the other guys in next year's class. But as I mentioned, the, the traits are out of the wazoo here. And he has all of the ability to take a big leap in 2022 and could threaten to be a first round pick in that 2023 uh, NFL draft. And if that happens, I mean, 206 is going to look like an absolute steal given the fact that he has the frame, given the fact that he has the ability to play X at the next level. This is a player that NFL teams will love. Yeah. He's got the, uh, the helmet scouting narrative to overcome. Oh, I'm yeah. sure. Fantasy Twitter is going to have a field day with TCU wide receivers, not working out <laughs> in the NFL, Jalen Rager, Josh Doxson. Everybody remembers the two guys that went high in the draft that didn't work out. So Quinton Johnson's got or Quinton Johnston has a bit of a, a narrative to overcome if he's going to be successful at the next level, because I'm sure he's going to get picked apart for going to TCU. 100%. Yeah, so Sky Moore, the next guy that we have here, of course, Sky Moore, Kansas City Chiefs wide receiver, went with second round draft capital. Again, if you wanted to draft him a little bit higher than this, wouldn't argue with you. But uh, Sky Moore, is where that's where he slides in here. The next guy that we have is our first tight end, actually, of this draft. Yeah. 
Yeah, and uh, I mean, this is the best tight end prospect since TJ Hawkinson. Michael Mayer, tight end from the Notre Dame. By the way, Kyle Pitts doesn't count as a tight end prospect. We're not counting him because he is just a freak. So pure tight end prospect. He is the best since TJ Hawkinson. Because I knew if you didn't say that, people would have commented that down below. Thank you for clarifying that. Kyle Pitts is just at a complete different rarefied air. When we're talking about Michael Mayer, though, Sophomore season this freaking year playing for Notre Dame put up a 5.9 reception, 70 yard, 0.58 touchdown per game stat line as a 20 year old tight end on Notre Dame. I mean, this guy is a freak. And as soon as he gets drafted again, this is an expected top 20, top 25 uh, NFL draft pick in the 2023 class. As soon as he gets drafted, this is going to be an immediate top six or seven tight end in dynasty period. I mean, this could be a guy that threatens in that top four type five type of area. Yeah. And in a tight end premium draft, he'll be oh, a, yeah. a locked and loaded first round pick, probably Absolutely. top eight pick next year in uh in dynasty rookie draft. So again, we're getting into the area now, like sky Moore is the two Oh seven in this draft. He's about a mid first round pick this year, right? In 2022 classes. So when we're talking about Michael Mayer and some of the guys that we're going to get into, we're talking about like late first round picks in the 2023 next, next class. Year. So if you can get, you know, a random 2023 first for your 107, 108, 109 this year, let's say you have like five first round picks. You got the 103, the 104, the 105, 107, and 109. If you can dump the 107 and 109 for random 2023 first, again, definitely going to be doing something like that. If you are a rebuilding team and you're looking to collect as much capital as you can in this upcoming class, the next guy that we have here is our consensus uh, 108, 109 in this year's class, Jahan Dotson, wide receiver from the Washington Commanders. Again, top 16 draft capital uh, prospect that I think is getting a little bit overlooked right now in 2022 classes. If you guys can get him anywhere near the late first round, I think he's a steal, but this is where he kind of fits in among these guys. And again, any any one of these wide receiver prospects, we went in depth in the wide receiver rankings video that we dropped a couple days ago. 210, Josh Downs, wide yeah. receiver from North Carolina in the 2023 class. Again, another guy that's going to get nitpicked for size. He's five foot 10, 180 pounds. He was Sam Howell's only option this year, not just his go to option, he was his only option uh, in 2021. 144 targets, 101 catches, 1,335 yards, and eight touchdowns. Sam Howell only threw like 3,400 yards this year, and this guy had. 1,335 of them, 38% target share over a 40% dominator rating as a true sophomore. And both of those numbers would rank in the, you know, 90 plus percentile for target share, 85th percentile for dominator rating. Hopefully Sam Howe leaving doesn't affect him too much and it doesn't nail his production too bad because I, I do think North Carolina is pretty good at scheming him open and scheming him uh place. So I think he should still be productive this year. Um, but Josh Downs is probably going to be the type of guy that's like a one, two turn pick in rookie drafts in 2023 and could be a massive steal just like, you know, another five foot, 10, 180 pound receiver like Elijah Moore was a couple of years ago. Yeah. And it's funny because again, we have Dotson and downs back to back, but I mean, you could make the argument that downs right now is probably going to project into a better prospect than Dotson. It's just, again, now that we know he's 16th overall draft capital, now we know that he's insulated into the NFL you prefer Dotson slightly, but I mean, Downs from a analytics guys will definitely prefer Downs for sure. 100%. Anybody who's a pure analytics person would definitely prefer Downs. And it, it, it's funny because I mean, from a stature standpoint, from a projectable role standpoint, I mean, Dotson and Downs are very, very similar players. I mean, you mentioned kind of Elijah Moore. Downs could be in that, like, you know, Elijah Moore, Tyler Lockett type of role in the next level. And I mean, who knows? Maybe uh, by next year, Washington wants to spend another first round pick on downs and you uh, have one of the best wide receiver trios in the league. Yeah. He got the shortest wide receiver duo in the oh, league yeah. with those two guys. If Terry McLaurin walks in free agency. So uh, the next guy that we have here is actually a quarterback. And I mean, again, this is a super flex draft. So we could have drafted these quarterbacks higher, but the problem is outside of Stroud and young, there is not really a huge consensus. Mel Kuyper said something about there being like six or seven first round quarterbacks next year. I'm not necessarily going to go that far. But Tyler Van Dyke is is what seems to be the third yes. best consensus quarterback as it stands right now. I know PFF has him as like a top 12, top 15 overall player on their board for next year's class. He was a redshirt freshman this year, so really young. More of the Mac Jones pocket passer mold, though. Not necessarily a guy that we're going to be overly excited about from a fantasy perspective. Only 155 rushing yards in 2021, but solid passing numbers. 9.8 adjusted yards per attempt. Again, as a redshirt fresh, uh, freshman, 25 uh, to 6 
touchdown to interception ratio between Tyler Van Dyke of Miami, Anthony Richardson of uh, the University of Florida, Phil Jerkovic from Boston College, Will Levitz from Kentucky, Grayson McCall from Coastal Carolina, Spencer Rattler and DJ Uangale, if you still care about those guys, Kadon Slovis, if you still care about him. There's a lot of names in this quarterback class that are coming up. I'm willing to bet one or two of these guys emerge into first-round caliber quarterbacks. I'm not sure who it's going to be as it currently stands. I know fantasy players would love if it's Anthony Richardson because he can run, and he's going to be very exciting from that perspective. But uh, it, it could be any of these guys, right? We have, really have no idea at this point in time. Yeah, and it's funny, again, like from a pure, you know, fantasy standpoint, like Anthony Richardson's probably going to end up being, you know, the Malik Willis of next year's class where he's a very, very raw player. But, I mean, if he could figure it out, I mean, this guy's got athleticism out of the wazoo, can contribute as a Konamiko type of player. But as we, you were kind of saying with Tyler Van Dyke, I mean, this guy's basically locked in right now in every mock draft you see as a top 15 overall draft pick in the 2023 class. He's got a, uh, you kind of mentioned the Mac Jones uh, or comparison, but uh, apparently from everyone I've been hearing, he has a cannon of an arm. Uh, maybe not the mobility, which is going to be a He's a big dude, 6'4", 225. Yeah. You got that arm talent. You know, he has a good season this year. Goes top 15, you know. I really, I, I really like the prospect of Tyler Van Dyke. Obviously, the main concern here uh, would be the rushing ability, which is why he's down here at 211. Like, if this guy was, you know, an above average athlete. I mean, we're talking about a guy that's probably hearing his name called at that one, two turn type of area for us right here. Well, if, if he, if he proves in his final season that he's like a Justin Herbert caliber athlete or something yeah. that we just like didn't see his redshirt freshman season, then maybe he, you know, elevates himself to like the consensus one Oh four, one Oh five in next year's class behind, you know, the top two quarterbacks and Bijan Robinson. For sure. For sure. So uh, transitioning off of uh, Tyler Van Dyke, let's go into the final pick of this two round mock draft. And this is the biggest projection, I think, thus far. Because if you look at his production these last two years, you're going to come away very disappointed. But my 212 here is going to be Jermaine Burton, wide receiver, newly of the Alabama Crimson Tide. And my case here is the Jamison Williams case. He played on an anemic Georgia passing offense that really lacked sufficient volume, and that really, really impacted his counting stats. But now he transfers to Alabama and figures to situate as their wide receiver one with both Jamison Williams and John Mechie moving on to the NFL. We talked about Bryce Young being a Heisman candidate. We talked about Jameer Gibbs being a Heisman candidate. We talked about the fact that Alabama is going to be one of the top teams in the country this year. If Jermaine Burton goes out and you know records 100 receptions, 1,700 yards, and 13 touchdowns, is a first-round pick by next year. He could absolutely explode from both a real-life NFL projection standpoint and from a fantasy football standpoint. So Jermaine Burton would be the wild card of this class, but I mean, I think it's way, way more likely that he strives this year with Bryce Young than he flops. Yeah, yeah, that that situation is obviously going to be really good with um, you know Gibbs running the ball and the other guy that they have there who's also draft eligible here. Yep. Um, they got a, they got a pretty good situation there. There's plenty of guys that we could have talked about too. Like Parker I mentioned, Washington. all those quarterbacks: Will Levitz, Grayson McCall, Phil Jerkovic, Anthony Richardson, etc. Spencer Rattler, DJ Uangale, um, Raheem Jarrett, uh, Zach Charbonnet. Like, there's a number of dudes Dante that we didn't Demas. even talk about. Yeah, um, your boy Blake Corum from Michigan. Yeah. Like, there's there's some dudes in this class that uh, we have not talked about either so we'll, we'll definitely you know mock up some 2023 stuff for our patreon and get that stuff for you guys so that you guys can get a, at least a, a preliminary feel of this of this class because some of these guys aren't going to work out right i'm sure 100%. you know a couple of these running backs a couple of these you know wide receivers maybe flop in their in their next seasons maybe we get uh to you know the fall and and quentin johnson's terrible and he's you know no longer on the the fantasy radar or whatever that's going to happen right we're, we're not going to go sunshine and rainbows with this draft class but we got a lot of, you know, bullets in the chamber for some great prospects here. It's it's a lot more bullets in the chamber than we had coming into the year this year for college football. So uh, this is going to be really exciting. So if you guys were curious, we had 15 players from the 2023 class and then nine players from the 2022 class that made up this 24 pick mock draft, two round mock draft combined 2022 and 2023 draft classes. I hope this draft helped you guys figure out, you know, if I'm at this point, in my rookie draft and I want to trade out, what should I be looking to get type of thing? That was the whole goal of this video, right? Number one, we want to get you guys um, some players on your radar to watch this college football season. And number two, we want you to understand the value of 2023 draft picks and why this class is so highly anticipated because I mean, at the top, at minimum, I don't anticipate the top guys disappointing. The the two quarterbacks, B. John Robinson, uh, JSN, and Jordan Addison, especially, like those dudes seem like they're pretty ironclad 
going to be studs in next year's class. The other guys, maybe you can make an argument for disappointing next year, but uh, it's going to be a fun class next year for sure. For sure. I mean, we're talking about 2022 and 2023. Guess what? I, I'm such a degenerate in the campus, the Canada circles that I can't wait until we repeat this exercise next year. And we talk about the 2024 class as well. A lot of young talent come to the NFL in these next coming years. You guys do not want to be mixing your picks. And I mean, let's just talk about it right now. If you're in startups right now, don't be dealing those future picks. I'll just say that right now. Yeah, do not deal your 2023 picks in a startup. In fact, I would encourage you to do the opposite and collect accumulate them. Can. So, yep. um, I think the best strategy, and we we might even uh, this could be a separate video idea that we could yep. go over. Just the best strategy in startups this year, specifically with what we know about this draft class, could be to punt year one, collect your wide receivers, collect your quarterbacks, collect your you know tight end or whatever. Get as many 2023 picks as you can, punt the running back position, and look to fill that out in the 2023 class, just given the strength of this year's draft class versus the strength of next year's draft class in 2024, because that way you'll align yourself with a winning window starting in 2023 with all these stud rookie running backs on your on your roster with your quarterback, wide receiver, and tight end core, hopefully already built out within the startup. For sure. Uh, but either way, last thing I'll say before we leave off, if you made it this far in the video, about 40 minutes in, like down below, comment you know, your favorite 2023 draft eligible player, you know, you're a big CJ Stroud fan, you're a big Jameer Gibbs fan, comment it down below who your favorite of these of this upcoming class is. And subscribe to the channel. We're currently at about 10.2 thousand subscribers. You know, who knows, maybe we hit 11,000 soon. It'll happen if you guys keep supporting us, keep getting this content shared to the channel. But either way, appreciate you guys for sticking around. Talk to you guys soon.